I first became aware of Dr. Hardiman probably in 2009 when there was this whole sort of uh, new energy about uh, taking the, uh, what we were learning about the brain from neuroscience, cognition, and applying it to uh, education. Makes perfect sense. You've got two disciplines that are fascinated and, and invested in our brains and how our brains work and what we can do, but they were not working together so much. So Dr. Hardiman has really been one of the, the leading uh, voices and, and persons pulling this all together. Uh, you can see from her uh, resume in the uh, program that she's done an awful lot of work. I wanted to point to three particular areas that I find intriguing. Number one, she is an academician, but she learned this in the trenches. She was 30 years in, in Baltimore public schools. She was the principal for uh, Roland, uh, Roland Park, I think, um, elementary, middle school, and developed this whole uh, brain-based training there. Uh, it did such a good job that it was even honored uh, as a school of distinction for arts programming and arts integration. Second point about Dr. Hardiman that she's also, you know, when she got into higher education, is a real innovator in higher education. She's, uh, Lauren and I have talked, we're both uh, fans of this idea of consilience. It's the jumping together of the humanities and the arts, the bringing together of disciplines that don't always come together. And this is exactly what Dr. Hardiman has done uh, at Johns Hopkins University. We were talking earlier, she was telling me that her program was the first that really started to bring together an interdisciplinary uh, look at both education and neuroscience. And third, She's a real translator of the science. She takes what we're learning and makes sure that we can put it into practice, put it into programs that, that really matter on the ground for teachers, for educators, for everybody. So with that, please join me in introducing and welcoming Dr. Mariel Hardiman. Oh. And I'll come back at the end and we'll do Q&A. So we'll go until about 8.10 or so. And so if you have questions, hold them till then. Thank you. Well, good evening, everyone. Thank you, Michael, for that nice introduction. And I am thrilled to be the person to start this off in Arts in the Brain, and in particular, as an educator, to be able to focus on children. Um, you've got a lot of wonderful topics over the next series, but we're starting to think about, here tonight, what the arts means for children. And you probably know how arts programs have been cut in schools across the country. Um, so we're going to talk a lot about that, why, why the arts are important, and they are. Um, so what do I do with my clicker? Well, how about we advance it this way? Ah, there it is. <laughs> so as Michael mentioned, um, I started um, an initiative with one of my um, colleagues at Hopkins, I direct it now, called the Neuroeducation Initiative. And you know there's about 540 brain scientists at Hopkins, you're going to meet some of them um, through this um, series. And um, they're across all these different units, from medicine to public health to the Mind Brain Institute. And so to have them come together to think about how science informs education was really something thrilling in Hopkins. And um, if you were here last year, the person whose picture is at the top is Dr. Charles Lim. Um, Dr. Lim is an otolaryngologist. It took me a long time to learn how to say that. <laughs> but he operates on ears. He's an ENP. Um, does some pretty traditional medicine like cochlear implants. But he's also a musician and he did the wonderful study that's world renowned called This Is Your Brain on Jazz. So we're going to be talking a little bit more about Charles Lim. He is um, the director of research for the NeuroEd Initiative, and so I work closely with him. We're collaborating on a study right now. And that's me as a school principal. 
Um, and as Michael told you, um, I did go from being a principal to what I'm now as a principal investigator. I put our pictures together to show the interdisciplinary nature of what we do. I am sure that when Charles, um, when I was, well, when I was a principal, I never thought that I would be working um, with someone who is in an fMRI lab. And I'm sure that when he was in med school, he'd never thought that he'd be working in the principal's office. <laughs> and my office still looks like a principal's office. So I want to talk about education now very broadly. First of all, let me ask, do I have any teachers here? Anybody that's K-12, K-16, pre-K-16? OK, few, good. OK. What's it? Oh, yay, arts integration teacher. Excellent. Come on up and do this presentation with me. <laughs> um, OK, so I'm going to be talking about education sort of in three big buckets. First is, what do we teach children? And you've probably been hearing a little bit about the new Common Core state standards. If you haven't, it's all out there that we're adopting standards across the country, common standards. And then the last green bucket is, what have our kids learned? Have you ever heard of No Child Left Behind? I'm sure, and you probably know a little bit about how that has narrowed education, right? And we're focusing so much, and especially in districts where um, we have high pockets of poverty, um, focusing very squarely on areas that are tested. So we know what that's done to areas not tested, especially the arts. The middle bucket is where my space is, and that is how are we teaching children? And so we're spending not that much time these days thinking about the how, and especially the how focused on what we know about how the brain thinks and learns. And as Michael said before, of all professions that should be looking at what we're learning from brain science, it should be educators who are consumers of this work. And so tonight what I'm going to do for you, double impact, is to connect for you what we should know about the brain sciences that would inform education, how it's connected to a model that I designed when I was a school principal called the brain targeted teaching model, and then finally how the arts are at the very core of that model the whole way through. So, Three questions that I'd like to address for you and answer is, what is brain science? What is brain-targeted teaching? And then how does brain-targeted teaching support the art? So let's talk about that. What are the findings from brain sciences that teachers should know, that parents should know, that everybody should know? And the first idea is plasticity. I'm sure most of you have heard about that. You sure will be if you keep coming to the series, and that is, Something that we didn't know 30, 40 years ago. We used to think that we had all the cells we were ever going to have, and our brain stopped growing around age three. And now we know that never stops, and that experience does change brain chemistry. Um, you know, I was standing there listening to some scientists at Hopkins talk a few years ago, and one of the top neuroscientists said, you know, 10 years ago I would have said, well, we do grow connections, plasticity, but we don't grow new cells. And now we know that's not true. We grow cells all the way up until we die. Emotions and learning, we're going to be spending some time looking at that connection. The idea of sensitive periods, that there are certain windows of opportunity, that the brain is more open to some kinds of learning. Um, memory, we're learning a lot about the brain's memory system. and how we can strengthen it through the right teaching strategies. More and more we're learning about physical health and learning and the importance of exercise. Arts and cognition, I'll be focusing a whole lot on in our presentation. And then attention and learning, the idea that attention can be taught. By the way, you know I'm a school educator, you know I'm an educator, and I did give you a form to take notes on because I'm going to be giving you a lot of content and so what you have there is a handout as a way to organize some of the, the things that we'll be talking about. Now I'd like to bust through neuromyths and I, I work with teachers all the time. Right now I'm doing um, courses at Hopkins, um, 30 hours of professional development in this model and I'm doing a professional development non-credit course 
for 45 Baltimore City public school teachers. Most of them believe these myths, so I do a little quiz ahead of time. So we're going to bust through them. First of all, everything important uh, in the brain develops between the age of zero and three, and we now know that's not true. We just talked about plasticity. Secondly, there are critical periods when certain things must be taught and learned. Actually, you know, I just talked about sensitive periods. Well, critical periods is kind of the myth that the brain stops learning something at a certain age. And now we know that the window closes a little bit, but it doesn't completely shut. So all of us here could learn a foreign language if we wanted. It would take us longer, and we'd probably not speak without an accent, but we could learn it. Um, on the other hand, there are certain things that are really important, like visual cortex completely closes up if there's no visual stimulation. And we all know about language probably by age 10. Uh, we know from studies of feral, ch feral children that if they are not given um, stimulation, language stimulation, they don't acquire it. Um, but almost, for almost everything else, um, we can still learn it, but it might be a little slower. Now, I still hear this. You only use 10% of our brain. Guess what? We use all of our brain, not just 10% of it. I can't figure out what the other 90% is busy doing if we're only using 10%, right? <laughs> I'm left-brained, you're right-brained. A lot of people think that, right? Well, I'm going to bust through that for you. Unless your corpus callosum is severed, that's the bundle of nerve fibers that connect the left and the right side of the brain, then you're using all of your brain for most tasks. That's not to say, though, that the brain isn't localized. In fact, it is, right? We know that um, the left side of the brain is highly specialized for language development, and the right side of the brain is very much into spatial orientation. So the brain is definitely localized, but again, we're not one or the other. We function as a whole. Um, because of hormones during puberty, teenagers can't learn. I, I have to just say, and if you're a middle school teacher, you're going to believe that, so I'm just going <laughs> to let that go. Listening to Mozart will make your baby smarter. I love Mozart. You probably all do, too. It doesn't make your baby smarter, really. That came from a small study that was done um, with a group of college students where they had a very small gain, like 15 minutes of memory. The researchers never meant it to be out in the neuromed field. Um, after that study came out, I think it was the governor of South Carolina sent a Mozart CD to every pregnant woman. He was <laughs> determined to have the best test scores in the state. <laughs> Now, this is one I put in bold because teachers just stand up and want to start crowding me and strangling me when I tell them this because they've been told this. Teachers should teach to each child's individual learning style. So let me tell you a little bit about learning styles. And when they hear about it, then they're relieved. OK, so most people believe that they're better at Either they're an auditory learner, or they're a visual learner, or they're a kinesthetic learner. They like to do things. Nod your head if you've heard that before, if you believe that. Most people believe it. Most people believe it because it's just part of common, of course, right? Yes. We either process in one side or another. So the idea of learning styles, this is a lot on here, but just I'll, I'll just kind of quickly tell you. Learning styles refers to the idea that individuals differ in regard to what mode of instruction or study is best for them. So if Mary likes to learn visually, then, and John likes to learn through auditory channel, then um, teachers should be teaching them that way. And there have been a lot of publishers that have made a lot of money off all these inventories that they sell to schools. So, Pashler and his colleagues tested this. They gave a movie, either it was a silent movie or it was a um, just visual, to people after that they were tested and said whether or not they were visual learners or auditory learners. So what you would expect to happen is that those who were visual learners would remember the film better if they watched it, and those who were auditory learners would learn it better 
if they heard it. But what happened was there was no difference. And this is being replicated now by Paula Talal and some of her folks at Rutgers, and they're finding pretty much the same thing in a randomized trial. So essentially, what we're learning from this is that there's really no evidence that we should differentiate instruction based on learning style. Now, I usually say to teachers, you told me earlier you believed in learning styles. How many of you go home every night and take your lesson plan and write it three different ways? How many of you write your lesson plan for your visual learners, then you take that same content and you write it for your auditory learners, and then, of course, for your kinesthetic learners, and they all start laughing? Because they don't do that. Teachers have a lot more common sense than policymakers do. <laughs> so, teachers don't do that. They don't slice up their lesson plan, but if they really believed in learning styles, they would. What teachers typically do is they differentiate based on content, which is what the researchers are now finally saying. What you've been doing all along is common sense works. If you're learning a foreign language, you're gonna be using the auditory channel a lot. Or if you're doing map skills, you're gonna be doing the visual channel a lot. And what I argue here is that the arts provide the best way to differentiate instruction and use multiple ways to present content because that's the bottom line, is that we don't need to slice it up. Content should be presented to students in multiple modalities, and there's no better way I know of than through the arts. By the way, I was a school principal, and did not, I don't have one artistic um, cell in my whole body. <laughs> I'm not an artist. And at first, I was a little leery of arts and arts integration, and made some big mistakes with it. But then I started to learn and see what it was doing to my school and my kids once we started integrating the arts, and you'll see all kinds of pictures. You won't believe it. Let's look at the brain for a minute. I know I have scientists in the room, so I'm not going to do a um, whole deep um, talk about the brain. You'll get that from others who are brain scientists, but we'll take a quick look. Um, the brain, instead of looking at it from left to right, we like to look at it from bottom up, and here you see the hind brain, and there's the different structures of the hind brain. We used to think it was just for breathing, autonomic kinds of activities such as that, but we're learning now that the cerebellum actually plays a role in a lot of other things, memory and attention and impulse control, and that even children with ADHD are showing differentiated um, sections of this part of the brain. Then we move up into the area that is the limbic system, also known as the emotional center, because it contains a structure called the amygdala. And that structure um, actually evaluates input for emotional content. So it starts with the thalamus there. You see that um, right there on this side, or if you're on this side, right there, the thalamus. And that's kind of the sorter. It's the relay station. All the senses, except the olfactory, um, all sensations come there. And the thalamus then sorts the information and sends it to the various parts of the brain, including the cortex, which we'll look at now in the frontal lobe. Um, so that's now, we're moving up into the frontal lobes, and that includes the cortex, includes the executive part of our brain. That's the thinking part, right? The part, we call it executive function, the part that is anticipation and predicting and planning and organizing and problem solving and decision making. So we're going to take, so here are some things. Martha Denkla from Kennedy Krieger Institute, I work with closely there. And she talks about the executive function part being a lot of tasks, like being able to start a task and then holding information and working memory, sort of like your desktop, right? Inhibit, being able to stop a task shifting from one to another, planning, organizing, monitoring yourself, and controlling emotions, all part of executive function and critical for children as they develop in school. Um, and by the way, I won't talk about this tonight because that's a different talk, but um, researchers are seeing huge differences with children in poverty and their higher income peers and the ability to do all of those executive function tasks that what we're calling allostatic load, which is stress from poverty, 
actually is diminishing brain areas, both structurally and functionally. Um, it, it's frightening. On the other hand, there are some wonderful interventions that are actually healing the parts of the brain. So um, we're going we're gonna to take a little exercise now. What I'd like you to do is see these. I want you to say the color of the word you see. So let's do it fast. If you do it with me, red, green, blue, fast. All right, do it again. The color of the word. <laughs> nope, no read. <laughs> Say the color. <laughs> Say the color. So some of you were laughing because that wasn't as easy, was it? Do you know three-year-olds could do the second slide as well as the first? Why do you think? Yeah, they can't read. So, so you're reading. So this is actually a test of executive function. This is, com this is a um, takeoff on the Stroop test. And that um, is one of the ways they assess, you know, children and adults who can do tasks like this faster have stronger executive function skills. So it's the, uh, this being able to quickly inhibit the desire to read it, because that's what you want to do. You know how to read. All right, so just an example. Okay, those are some pretty feet there. Um, they're not mine. I used to have a picture of my feet, and it grossed people out. So <laughs> I, I went on the internet and got some pretty feet. So I start. I show you this slide to tell you why I call my sorry why I call my model brain targeted teaching. Um, one of my colleagues at Hopkins a few years back, when I was developing the model, said. You know, that term, brain-based learning, that is the stupidest term I've ever heard. Where else would learning occur but in the brain? After all, we don't think with our feet. And I looked at him and I said, right, that's a really stupid term. But, so yes, all learning occurs in the brain, so calling any learning brain-based is, is a little ridiculous. However, all teaching does not result in learning. So while all learning is brain-based, all teaching is not. Therefore, my model is teaching targeted to how the brain thinks and learns. And so those are the six components of the model. And now we're going to move into the model. And I'm going to talk to you about each of these six components. And we're going to connect it to some research from neurocognitive science, what we do in the classroom, and how it supports the arts. And I'm going to argue that the emotional climate, that the art, arts help to evoke emotion. And you'll see how important that is to learning. For the physical environment, it adds beauty and novelty. For designing learning, the next target, it helps to make big concepts accessible to children, to be able to show it to children in a graphic, visual kinds of way. Mastery of learning. Um, that's where our arts integration program fits in. Um, arts provide a way for children to remember information better. Application of knowledge, arts provide a way for children to apply learning better. And finally, the, art, the artist's portfolio is actually the model for how we should be evaluating children in school. And again, I'd argue that being able to fill out one answer out of four on a test is not education and that we should be educated, we should be assessing children on a variety of measures and measuring what they know in a variety of ways. The arts are a model for how to do that. So let's move into the emotional climate for learning, positive emotional climate, and emotions actually promote learning. So first thing I want to talk about is the emotions affect attention, which affects learning. Now, I can't tell you how many times I've heard teachers say to children, leave your emotions at the door, you're here to learn, right? Or even in the workplace, you know, don't bring, don't bring that stuff in here, we've got work to do. But that's impossible and you'll see why. First of all, let's go back to the slide on the brain again. You can see that the limbic system, and remember we talked about the amygdala, um, is connected to all the brain and that the, the signal um, is connected to and the emotional 
part sends a signal all the way to the frontal lobes, which is your thinking center. Now, so the thalamus is processing this, and it's sending information, that signal, simultaneously to the amygdala as it does to the frontal lobes, the thinking part of the brain. Except something is happening. According to Joseph Ledoux, information is processed in the amygdala before the frontal lobe. So why am I saying yikes? You get an A for today's lesson. <laughs> so what she said was that we're processing through emotions. We can't shut down the emotional center so that we can think. So now, when the amygdala perceives threat, it triggers a body-wide response. And you know this is fight or flight, right? And that kind of response produces hormones, mostly cortisol, um, which is really a beneficial for many, many reasons, but not when it lingers in the body and we have that fight or flight response constantly. So we believe that our biological systems actually were meant to really help us to survive right, that fight or flight. But in our lives today, stress can be an ongoing event. You know, when we, were, when we evolved, we either ran away from the cyber-toothed cyber tiger, or we were its lunch, and then that was it. But the effects of stress and on the body today, the effects of cortisol, Energy consumption increases, heart rate, blood pressure, breathing quickens, liver releases sugar. And, um, well, high cortisol all the time in the body really doesn't do some good things. So for one, we lose efficiency in working memory, and working memory is important because if you can't think about what you've just learned, you're not going to be able to hold it into long-term memory. And um, it causes more errors in information processing. So bottom line, we know that stress impedes learning and actually may affect, and we now know from um, recent studies, does affect brain structures. On the other hand, what we're learning is that positive emotion actually has been shown to help subjects learn better, um, increasing attention, for example, and motivation for learning. So given all that I just said, this statistic is pretty frightening, and that's that when kids support, when kids report the emotion they're feeling in school, anxiety is the top emotion they feel. So, how can we prevent kids having anxiety? Well, one way is how we talk to kids. And, um, you know, here's an example of different kinds of criticism. Saying to a child, oh, you're not a very good painter, or that is, we're talking about their person, or their outcome, you're not very good, this is not a very good painting, or the process, you may not have worked very hard. And you can imagine what would make the child feel the worst, right? You're not a very good painter. Well, Carol Dweck and her friend and her colleagues compared how fifth grade students responded when praised for intelligence versus effort. They gave the kids math problems, um, easy ones, to 400 fifth graders, and almost all did well. And then they said to the student, they divided them, half of them were praised for being smart, and the other half were praised for having worked really hard. Then the children were presented with another task. They were told, okay, now you have a more difficult task. And what happened was, when the children who were praised for being really smart 
chose the easier task. The children who were praised for effort chose the harder task. So what they believe is that children who are praised for smart thinks intelligence is stagnant. I wish I'd known this when I was a parent, because I told my kids they were smart a lot. <laughs> and actually, this study holds up time and time again. This has been replicated in lots of different groups in lots of different countries. And when you tell children they're smart, they adopt a more passive attitude toward learning. On the other hand, when you praise for um, effort, they want to do more. So we're going to do a little exercise now. So if we could pass these back real fast. All right. Everybody have one? OK, open it up and do what it says. All right, we ready? Let's close your paper. Now, without peeking, write the words you remember. OK, now, what I'm going to do is when I say a number that corresponds to how many you wrote, hold up your paper. 10. Hold up your paper. Oh, I see I've got some people right here. Hold up your paper and look around. 10, 9. All right, eight. All right. This side of the room has good memory. Seven. Oh, now we're starting to see uh, six. Five. Four and under, be honest. All right, the back of the room doesn't remember so well. Actually, you all had different directions, and you responded to this exercise as classic as every group ever has, and that is well, I'll tell you in a minute. If you had a green piece of paper, your direction said, memorize this list of words. So, right? No wonder they were able to remember them because they were told to memorize them. And, by the way, when I give the directions, those who have the green piece of paper get right to work. Right? It's like, okay, sure, you told us to memorize them, and now I'm going to write them down. Those who have the orange piece of paper, again, in this room, you were great. You responded so classically, and that is you laugh. Because the orange piece of paper said, count the number of vowels in the words. So they're saying, like, what words? <laughs> right? They're not really reading the words, right? They're just counting the vowels. Well, you had pink. So if you had a pink piece of paper, it said rate the word for its pleasantness, one being most pleasant, the other being least pleasant. And I bet you you remembered your ones and your threes, your neutral words you didn't remember. Good. OK, so here's how it turned out this time. It turns out like this every time, no matter if I have 700 people in a room or seven. Long-term memory, if I were to come back here in about a week, those who had the orange piece of paper, didn't remember much, and would lose memory even more. Um, those who memorized the words would lose memory probably the greatest, because massing information is not um, the best way to learn. But those who had the pink would have the most retention. Why do you think that is? Go ahead. Because of the emotional connection for learning. So we just did a research project right here, right? And now you believe me that the emotions are critical to memory. And right here, 11 studies indicated that positive emotions correlated strongly to metacognitive strategies and negative emotions related to task irrelevant thinking and the need for external regulation. This is a terrific book if you haven't read it. Jill Bolt-Taylor, A Stroke of Insight. She's a neuroscientist who watched her brain coming back online after she had a stroke. She says, although many of us think of ourselves as thinking creatures that feel biologically, we are feeling creatures that think. Now, let's go to the arts. The arts can have a positive effect on school experience. And here are three studies. Listening to music reduced individuals' levels of cortisol. And you've just learned how important it is not to have cortisol in your body through stress. 
I told you about allostatic load and the idea that many children in poverty are actually diminished in their executive function skills. Um, and so music has been shown to actually lower cortisol levels. Another is that troubled youth displayed more positive pro-social behaviors after specific instruction in visual and performing arts. Why are they taking the arts out of school? I don't know. Finally, arts build skills in persistence, collaboration, and improvisation. And here's an example of having the arts in a class. This was at my old school, and they were studying the novel Hatchet, which was about survival. Um, a young boy is on a plane that crashes in the Canadian Rockies, and he's surviving alone in the wilderness. And it's a survival novel. And so the kids now are trying to feel empathy for the character. And so they're doing self-portraits of how they would feel if they were stranded in the Canadian Rockies. And it brings that emotional content into what they're learning. In this case, the children are doing tableau. And they're forming body positions that speak to how they would feel as the character. And we embed a lot of those kinds of activities in some of the work we do. So there's a lot of best practices to brain target one. I've truncated this for you. I do 30 hours of training in the brain targeted teaching model, and we're going to do it in about less than an hour. Um, but notice that there's a lot there. Um, this is all on my website. But predictability and routines is one of the things that we, um, we want ch teachers to do with children. And teachers write learning units that use brain targeted teaching model, and this is what we do. So now I'm going to move in from the emotional environment now into the physical environment and tell you that novelty, light, sound, movement, and the arts are all important. So novelty triggers the brain's alerting system. And the same stimulus presented over and over again actually produces a reduced interest in the material. I know teachers that put every poster up in their room in September and take it all down in June. <laughs> and that becomes wallpaper for kids. So, right? They don't, it's not, it's not helping them. So when you think about yourself, when you put a new pillow in your room or you put a new lamp, where do your eyes go when you walk into that room? Right there, right? So there's a lot of studies. Again, I'm not going to get into all of them with you about optimal lighting. Obviously, it is nat mo the ma most natural light is showing um, the best kinds of uh, behaviors as well as academics for children. Um, we know that too much noise impairs learning. Um, here's a Here's an example. Think of yourself driving down the highway and you're relaxed and listening to your music and suddenly you veer off the highway and you don't know where you're going and you've got to get over four lines of traffic and what do you do? Turn, turn, you turn off your music. So what does turning your music off have to do with you finding your way? <laughs> but it has a lot to do. So when when we need to focus and concentrate, even nice relaxing music can be a distractor. Um, sense, we use sense in the environment in this model. Exercise, order, and beauty, and we have research that supports all of this. This was the, um, just wanted to show you some pictures, the cafeteria of my school, um, where we used it as an art room. This was the hallway that used to be um, full of um, red streaks and yellow streaks. And this came up from the cafeteria. Can you imagine what those streaks were? Mustard, Mustard and ketchup. <laughs> but after the children started to see these beautiful vistas, this was done by an artist over a weekend. I will tell you that the noise level, this is three floors, she did the seasons, the noise level were reduced and there was never one more part of graffiti. The kids loved it. And so to go from cinder block to seeing these vistas really expanded their world. There's so many schools today that have no windows, and children are sitting in cinder block rooms. 
There's a study from Tanner, and he says that window gazing is the most important thing we can do in schools. Put windows there and let them gaze out the window. Because when children are gazing out a window, coming back to focus is so much easier than when they're texting somebody or writing a note or doing something else to distract themselves. So we should never have taken windows out of schools or put that plastic stuff up so kids can't see out. So these kinds of vistas we would put all through the school. This is a classroom, I'll show you. This was a classroom where the um, lighting was changed and it created dark shadows for the kids. So the teachers used natural light and put lamps. This was not in my school. <laughs> I would never have a room like this, <laughs> too much distraction. And I, as artists, I want you to look at that classroom. What do you notice about that classroom? It's neater than the other one, more organized, but look at the walls. All commercial materials, nothing made from children. This is gaining in popularity too, having kids balance themselves. So this was at my school, and this was a way that we took art, and the teacher put that tree, and when children needed that big stretch, they would go and become that tree. So it was a way she embedded art and had it help the children just in their physical. So that's brain target two, and that is the focus on the environment. Again, there is a growing body of studies that support all I told you. And now we're going to talk about the design um, and how we design our learning experience. So I'm going to ask you to look at these words again very quickly. Here she goes again, making us right words. Those teachers, <laughs> they always make us work. I know, I showed them very quickly. See if you can get a few down. All right, here are the words. I won't make you work too hard. And I won't make you raise your hand, but my guess is somebody wrote the word sleep. Okay, I, <laughs> I see some nods. So why would anybody write a word they didn't see? <laughs> oh my gosh, I love that reaction. No, sleep's not there. The word sleep is not there. But many, many people write that word. Thank you. It's related. So what the brain is doing is something called patterning. It's categorizing stimuli and forming concepts. And we never do this for children. We teach them one thing after the next, and we never let them see the bigger picture. It's as though, if you look at my icon there, if you tried to put a puzzle, a jigsaw puzzle together, but you never saw the picture, the individual pieces wouldn't make much sense, right? So what we do is we know that knowledge is not organized around a list of facts, but it's organized around big ideas. Um, Interestingly enough, young children will say those two um, images are the same. These two images are the same, and these two are different. And after about six, they'll say the opposite. They'll say that the first two images are different. So if you can see here, what are the young children looking at? Why do they think these are the same? Yeah, the individual parts, right? So individual, so it's a developmental our brains developmentally, at around six years old, start looking for the big patterns. Um, younger children are probably advantaged looking at the pieces because language acquisition and reading acquisition requires that kind of detail. But what we know then about how the brain learns is that the brain does want to see the bigger picture, just like those of you who wrote the word sleep. So in the brain targeted teaching model, we start by giving children the overview of what they're learning. Here's Hatchet again, that we're going to call this surviving alone in the wilderness. And we're going to be looking at three main ideas, learning to use the natural environment, listening to your inner voice, becoming a different kind of observer. And we're going to integrate the arts all through that. 
and the children will learn what they have to do. They take nature walks, they draw natural objects. Um, this is a beautiful lesson. Um, just some other examples. Here's one in Leonardo's notebook. This is um, Baltimore Lab School. It's, an, it's a school for children with um, fully arts integrated school uh, for children with learning disabilities. And they actually um, make Leonardo's design for the flying machines. And there's a lot of different ways to present information visually to kids to give them big picture concepts, even pictorially for young kids. All right, I'm going to go quickly through this because I want to take us to Brain Target 4, which is teaching for mastery. How am I doing, Michael? OK, good. All right, so we've talked about three things now. Those of you who are following in, in your notes, we talked about the emotional environment and the importance of emotions to learning. We talked about the physical environment and how it helps with attending behaviors in children, novelty especially. And then we talked about designing learning, giving children visual representation. And those of you who are visual artists understand the power of a picture, right? Now we're going to talk about what children are learning, teaching children to mastery. Because if they don't learn anything, then why go to school? So we'll start with Lucy. She says, hey, Charlie Brown, guess what? I taught Woodstock to whistle. And Charlie Brown thinks about Woodstock and says, well, that's funny. Woodstock can't whistle. And she smiles very smugly, and she says, no, stupid. I said, I taught Woodstock to whistle. I didn't say I learned it. <laughs> How many teachers say, I taught them? I don't know why they didn't learn it. I taught them. Or the kids go to school the next year, and they say, no, we never learned that. Division? No, we didn't learn that. <laughs> so like twin stars, Learning and memory are intricately connected, right? Learning is acquiring information, but memory allows that to go from what we called the working memory before. Remember, we talked about executive function from working into long-term memory. And if it doesn't go to long-term memory, then you'll never remember that there are three branches of government, right? So the most important factor for memory is the degree to which we rehearse and we repeat that information. If you want to learn how to hit a tennis serve, you're not going to go out and try it once and say you know how to do it, right? So that makes sense. If you're a musician, you've got to practice. Memory also depends on certain kinds of elaborations. Let's go. OK. So, Researchers in cognitive psychology have discovered numerous ways to improve memory, and many of these factors, I will argue, are naturally part of various forms of artistic activity. And we believe that the use of arts integration, and my postdocs and I have a paper out called Why Arts Integration Improves Long-Term Retention of Content, um, we argue that arts integration naturally recruits these memory effects that have been long tested. So let me talk now about how we focus on the arts in schools. The first is art education. And that is that all students, first of all, all students should have arts education. They should have an arts program. And I'm going to show you some neuroscience studies that actually show that there's some transfer from what kids are learning into other domains of learning. So the art teacher incorporates content. That's one way to do that in, into the art curriculum. Another leg of the arts in school are arts and cultural activities, right? So you have the art educator in the school. Then you have coming to wonderful institutions like this and others that um, bring children culture, and that I can, like to connect with the idea of plasticity because we know experience changes the brain. And when children have those opportunities, they're different. And so here's an example of our kids going to all the different cultural resources in our city. The third leg is arts integration. And what I mean by that is teaching with and through the arts. 
that the teachers actually use art forms to teach a content area in science or social studies. Um, this is an example of a Latin class in my previous school using the arts. So the arts, um, again, we, we call it teaching through the arts, um, using it in any of the content areas. And part of the benefits of this is that it helps the kids visualize. It connects visualization with, for example, reading comprehension. It helps them to conceptualize better and it helps bring experience. So, you know, the art forms, visual arts help with seeing and feeling. The kinesthetic movement is important. Drama is one of the most powerful, well-researched areas that help children with memory. Music, clearly, and creative writing. And here are some examples of kids who were studying in the art room botanical paintings and then studying about the parts of the flower. And coming up, these are third graders producing artwork. Yeah, I mean, and these are, this was not done in art class. This was done in science. And then kinesthetic, you know, just being able to use movement and how important that is. And here's another picture of the tableau again. Um, the idea that movement is brought into the classroom. Theater, as I said before, is one of the most well-researched areas. And of course, music. Not just hearing, but teaching children to listen. And here's a few examples of some arts integrated units. Here, this one is teaching Maryland Native history. This one is teaching about ancient cultures. Here's ancient Greece. Um, those of you who are interested in the body of research on the arts, this is a new website out, um, artsedsearch.org. And it has, um, it's a clearinghouse for arts education research. Artsed.org. Um, some of you are familiar with the Dana Foundation, so now I want to go into some of the studies about the arts that the Dana Foundation found, founded. Um, a few years back, they funded um, scientists to study the effects of arts on learning. And here are some of the results they found from the Dana Foundation. Um, their report was Learning Arts in the Brain. And at Johns Hopkins the following year, um, I ran a summit and brought all these, uh, these researchers to sit down with educators in a summit. And um, we produced a book, and I'll tell you a little bit about that in a minute. But first, let's look at Brian Wandell, what he found. Correlations exist between the amount of music training and the amount of improvement in reading fluency. That's the speed of reading. Um, links between the practice of music and skills in geometric representation from Liv Spelke. So music has been highly researched in supporting areas such as reading, fluency, and mathematics. Performing in visual arts, Mike Posner found that they heightened students' sustained attention. So when he compared kids who had been um, doing an art form versus kids who didn't, they ended up actually doing better in, remember the executive function part we taught? We, talked about before in the colored words, they actually did better in executive function skills and sustained attention. And then specific links exist between high level of music training and the ability to inf manipulate information in working memory and long-term memory. And Liz Spelke found these domains went well beyond reading. Training and acting actually led to memory improvements. Um, though not necessarily by the fact that they were memorizing scripts and could memorize better. Actually, they were better at understanding the gist of the content. So the actors were more liken, likely to mistakenly believe they had seen sleep. <laughs> This is interesting to me as a um, remedial salsa dancer. <laughs> and that is to learning to dance by effective observation 
is closely related to learning by physical practice. So when you watch Dancing with the Stars, or if you watch a tennis player, right, um, the same parts of your brain are active as though you were doing the actual information yourself. Yeah. And I had people tell me, before I heard about this study, that after they watched the um, U.S. Open, that they'd go out and they were better tennis players. And I thought, oh, no, it couldn't be. You're just watching television. How could you be better? This study shows it's true. So now when I go out, I look for the best salsa dancers there are, and I sit and watch them for a while. Then I go out and try their moves. <laughs> okay, here's a very interesting study. And, you know, a lot of these were correlational studies I talked to you about. So the question here is, what comes first, the chicken or the egg? You know, maybe these kids already were predisposed, um, and the, all this music training, it just correlated, but kids, but there wasn't any causation. So in this study, um, the question was, does intensive music training lead to plasticity, to brain changes, um, which would be nurture, or are some people just simply predestined to become musicians? So in this study, Hyde and his colleagues studied six-year-olds who had only 15 months of musical training, and they compared them then to a control group who didn't have that training, and they found increased brain size in multiple areas of the brain, including the frontal lobe, remember, executive function again, right, that controls higher order thinking and planning. And they showed greater skills in motor and um, other skills. So um, we're, we know that music is doing something, and that was only 15 months. That wasn't that long in order to show the structural changes. Okay, so again, we believe that the arts provide. Remember before I said rehearsal and elaboration, the arts provide that. Here are eight memory effects that my postdoctoral fellows and I wrote in our paper that we found through cognitive science actually improves memory, like rehearsal, elaboration, generation, enacting, producing. Effort after meaning means you have to struggle with something. So let me show you some examples. Generation effect, creating an artwork, drawing inferences, um, the enactment effect, effect, physically acting something out, like the tableau you saw. Production effect, actually producing something orally, whether it's a rap or a poem. Um, effort after meaning, puzzling over the content of what a painting is. P picture superiority effect, in this study they found that people remembered details when they saw a picture better than when they were told about it, because much more of the brain is actually involved in visual processing than anything else. And then emotional enhancement of memory, and we've already talked about the importance of that. So here's a painting, right? And so you can see kids probably studying that and trying to figure out what that is and learning through um, their teacher about Washington crossing the Delaware. And there's a lot of activities you could do on that. I'm not going to go through all of them, but here's one. <laughs> And that was done by a second grader, and he will probably always remember that George Washington wasn't very happy because it was Christmas and he was missing his family. <laughs> and so there's his frown. Um, so now I want to talk to you about why, why arts integration isn't used all the time and what we can do about it. I will tell you that integrating the arts, as I have shown you, um, is a growing practice, actually. And there are many institutions that support it, from Kennedy Center to um, you know, arts organizations. Um, many, it's spreading. But every bit of research is correlational. So nobody's done a randomized trial yet, except for us. We are now in our second study. We did a preliminary study, and we're now funded by the U.S. Department of Ed, my postdoctoral fellow team and I, to study in a randomized way the effects of arts integration on long-term retention. 
We're writing right now in the process of writing four units in four, fifth grade science, astronomy, ecology, life science, and physics. We're writing tr control units, which are conventional instruction, and matching it to treatment units. We're matching it for the amount of time. So if, it, if it's a 10 minute activity in a conventional, it's a 10 minute arts integrated activity. We don't want anybody to say, well, kids learned it through the arts better because they spent three days doing that activity in the arts where they only spent 10 minutes in the regular. So we're matching it completely. We're matching it for content completely and we're matching it for the mode of presentation, either whole group, teacher directed, student directed. Um, so that's what, our, that's what it looks like. So every group of randomized kids will get one unit taught through arts integration and then a second unit in a different content taught through traditional. And every teacher, to control for teacher effect, will teach one unit both ways. And we have observers in the classroom to make sure that treatment doesn't bleed into control. And so here are some activities I'll just tell you very briefly, like vocabulary, the differences in the control. The children are um, studying vocabulary words and then writing what they word, those words are in their own words. So you know, that's how they're elaborating. In the treatment, in the arts integrated, they're keeping a visual vocabulary book and they're told to sketch or to doodle. We, we tell them not to draw because a lot of kids will say, well, I can't draw. But everybody can do it or sketch, right? Um, and here's some examples of what kids did in terms of their visual vocabulary. Another one is celestial bodies we were teaching. Um, and what is a planet? What is a star? What's the difference between a planet and a star? And that they're doing that through discussion. That would be conventional instruction. The teacher shows them this. The kids talk about it. Um, in the arts integrated, they become, they do role playing. So this is what's happening in role playing. Um, the, the girl here has on a box, this is simple stuff, right? Just, she just has some tinfoil around her and that's a flashlight. And so what is she? Okay, she's a planet. <laughs> oh. Yeah, this is, this is science stuff. I'm, I'm not good at science. So he's a star because he's, he's emanating light, right? And she's a planet because she reflects light. So when kids learn that in school, it, it doesn't seem like, you know, if they're learning it through traditional ways, they're not going to remember it as well as when they role play it, right? Um, so let's see, what else? Um, oh, here. You know, we do a lot of sequential stuff. So here was, in this activity, um, the steps from a comet to a meteorite. What happens when a comet becomes a meteorite? And in the arts integrated unit, the children were told that they were Hollywood producers and they had to storyboard it. And so now they're storyboarding the steps. So, we believe that arts integration, like that, simple activities will make children be better learners and remember information better. And now we're going to move the last couple brain targets. Brain target five is creative problem solving. You've probably all learned about 21st century skills, which is kind of the way of, hey, we've got to stop having kids pick one answer out of four or multiple choice tests. But here's the problem. And those of you like Michael who are studying creativity probably know that while IQ and SAT scores actually have improved over the last two decades, creativity scores as measured by a common test, the Torrance test of creative thinking, have significantly declined. So we are producing children and the longer they're in school, the less creative they are. Yeah. So there's different kinds of creativity, but what we, we tell teachers is that research is showing that creativity is pliable. You know, I think we think of ourselves as either you're creative or you're not. Creativity is pliable, it can be taught, and it, could, and it can be taught in rigorous ways, and it can be measured in rigorous ways. I'll show you Charles Lim's study in a minute. 
Um, but I do want to talk about adaptive expertise, which is, which is the idea that we can't be creative about something we don't know anything about. So in the brain-targeted teaching model, we scaffold it. We make sure children have learned content. And when they learn that content, they then apply it. I can't be creative about being a heart surgeon because I don't know how to do that. You wouldn't want me to be that. Um, so we'll go back here. There are a few studies that I'll show you. Chavez Eccles um, and her colleagues reported that creative individuals show greater activity in the brain areas involved in emotion and working memory, um, greater right hemispheric activation, increase in brain activity when subjects displayed more original ideas. Um, we're going to move here. Keith Sawyer talks a lot about improvisation. And I'm jumping ahead because I want you to see the work of Charles Lim. So that's an fMRI scanner, right? Um, anybody ever be in an fMRI scanner yet? OK. So Charles Lim um, recruited his um, friends who were musicians. Charles is a jazz musician. And he had them, um, in one condition, learn a piece of jazz music that he had provided for them. And then in another condition, he had background music, and he told them to improvise. By the way, he created a sort of a half a keyboard with no metal parts so it could go into a scanner. And what Charles says, and there's a lot of writing here, and I'm going to tell you exactly what all this means, is that he found that when the jazz musicians were in the improvisational state, that something very different happened in their brain. The actual, the sides of the brain, the, it says here, the medial prefrontal cortex went up, this part of the brain. And what he means by that is it was more active, right? Um, and that's the part of the brain that's autobiographical, self-referential, self-expressive. And the pre and the lateral prefrontal regions, the sides, actually went down. And that's the part that's self-inhibitory, self-censoring and self-monitoring. So he is actually doing that study again with rap musicians and others. He's continuing this line of work and is continuing to show how the brain works differentially when it is in improvisation state, which he equates to being creative versus memorized. So when you think about what children do in school and extrapolate a little bit of this, children are not being rewarded for um, being autobiographical. <laughs> and they're certainly not rewarded if they're not self-inhibitory, right? In fact, we might give kids medicine to make sure <laughs> that they control those impulses. So if that's a neural signature, that's really, that's really important to education. And the idea of creative thinking and problem solving and allowing kids to be more expressive is actually crucial to their development. And more and more studies are showing this. And this is what we typically get in education. If you can't see it, it says, just a darn minute. Yesterday, you said x equals 2. <laughs> but that's what we're teaching kids. Kids want the right answer because that's what they're being held accountable for, right? Um, you know, divergent versus convergent thinking. The idea that in school, teachers always are asking for the right answer rather than saying kids to think in a more divergent way that there's no right answer. You know, just generate your ideas. Um, and then finally, um, I think I'll just quickly go through this feedback. Um, how important feedback is to kids in school for evaluating learning. And in this study, just the anticipation of feedback. And again, we, we believe that the arts really help kids get feedback really quickly on what they're doing. Um, in this study, subjects were told they would get um, feedback the first day all the way to 17 days out is when they get feedback on their performance. And you can see there the linear performance, you know. So e the anticipation of feedback actually made subjects do better. So there's a lot of research about how feedback improves retention. Um, 
This is really interesting study, and I'll, I'll explain this very quickly to you. Um, the other thing is active retrieval, and this is important because I think this relates really completely to the arts. Um, if you were told that you had to take a test on something, typically what you'd do is go study. If I gave you some information and said I'm going to test you on it, what is common is that we study. But study after study after study is now showing that just taking inform in information, studying, does not do very much for long-term memory. So in this study, subjects were given word pairs, Swahili English word pairs. They were told in the word pairs to, um, to study and to quiz themselves, to test, study and test. That's this group. They studied at regular intervals and they were tested. This group only were tested at regular intervals. This group only studied at regular intervals and this group did nothing. So you can see that actively retrieving information, so it, it makes sense when you think about it, right? That when you have to produce information, it actually recruits more from your memory system than when you take it in and you're passively studying. So what we argue and what the researchers here argue is that this is not about, it's called the testing effect. It's really not about testing. It's about the idea that if you actively retrieve something, you're going to memor memorize it. You're going to remember it better. My daughter's in med school. Every time she'd take a test, she'd sit there and she would look at the film or the, the PowerPoints of the lectures. She'd go back and she'd watch the lectures again. And I kept telling her, your mother knows something. <laughs> <laughs> Don't listen to the lecture. Quiz yourself because that's passive. If you quiz yourself, you'll actively retrieve the information. When she started to listen to me, she said, you know you do know something. <laughs> so what we know is that First of all, cramming, what they call masked learning, produces very poor memory for information, but repeated active retrieval is the way to remember something. And then finally, re repeated active retrieval does not have to be a traditional test like we see on the left. It can be an artistic venture. On the right, the teacher measured the same thing. It was measuring the children's ability to understand perimeter and area. So on the left, it was a traditional test from the textbook. And on the right, she said to the child, now think of a farm, decide what animals you want on the farm, and decide how big the pens need to be. And then put your measurements there. And then she had a rubric, so the kids knew exactly what they were to do and how they would be graded. So evaluation can be artistic, too. And here's getting back to Hatchet. Um, the evaluation for that novel Hatchet was that children had to produce a survival box so that the next child who was stranded in the Rockies would find that survival box. And they put in the tools that would be needed for survival. And actually, they did, they applied it in their own neighborhoods too and went all through the neighborhoods and found the resources in the neighborhoods where healthy foods were, where they would find a police station, where they'd find a fire station, where they'd find a medical clinic, and wrote a survival neighborhood guide, taking that information that was in this novel and bringing it into real world, real world context. So that's the brain-targeted teaching model. You may say, does it work? Um, we are doing studies now. Um, what we're finding, and I don't have that in here, is that when teachers learn how to teach this way, it is improving a construct called teacher efficacy. That's the belief that all children can learn. So if you understand how children think and learn, what we have found in our preliminary studies is that it changes one of the hardest things it is to, there is to change with teachers, and that's the belief that kids can learn, which is critically important for those teaching in urban areas. You know, the old idea that, oh, I can teach, but those kids can't learn. Um, when they learn about plasticity and neurogenesis and all the things we talked about here in this model, 
um, we're finding, we've got, done three cohorts now, that it does change um, their belief system. In this study, a, a doctoral student wanted to study brain-targeted teaching, and he did this study um, a few years back, um, he, a treatment and control school. What I'm the slide I'm showing you here is, um, this is the study site compared to the control. The control did better than the study site before the students started learning brain-targeted teaching. And this group, this is a disaggregated group, and FARM stands for free and reduced meals. So those are the poorest kids out of both schools, the kids who live in poverty. And you can see how their scores shot up after learning this way and through the arts. And so, this is, while this is correlational, one thing I you know, can only guess what it means, but I will tell you that in most urban settings, to improve test scores, they get rid of the arts, right? And children are double dosed in reading and math because the school doesn't want to be called failing. But I think this might suggest that when children in poverty are given a chance to be creative thinkers and problem solvers, that this is the state test and these are advanced scores, that they can achieve advanced levels like everybody else if we only give him, them the opportunity. So to review again, the arts evoke emotion, the arts add beauty, the arts make big concepts visible and accessible, the arts provide for repeated rehearsal and elaboration. The arts provide ways to apply knowledge and creative thinking and problem solving. And the arts provide a model for evaluating learning. So there's Bill Clinton. He says, we live in a rapidly changing, highly interdependent, increasingly complex world. We need the discipline and order of a rigorous adherence to the facts of life and the creativity we can only learn, young to old, from the arts. Thank you, Bill Clinton. But we will not let Bill have the last word. <laughs> that goes to Emily Dickinson. And because poetry is something I talked about, but really didn't talk about much, we're going to end with the amazing work of Emily Dickinson as she tried to think about the brain. The brain is wider than the sky, for put them side by side, the one the other will contain with ease and you beside. The brain is deeper than the sea, for hold them blue to blue, the one the other will absorb as sponges buckets do. The brain is just the weight of God, for heft them pound for pound, and they will differ if they do as syllable from sound. Thank you for your attention tonight. All right, so now, as Mariel taught us, the best way to learn is to be tested. So we're going to test you on some of the... No, actually, we're not going to do that, but there's a... There's a lot of information here today, so uh, this is an opportunity to, it was, if there were questions that you had, you didn't quite get something, or there are thoughts that have occurred to you, you want to sort of sure. get into, this is your time. You raise your hand, and I'll come and... Yes. One of the, I don't need that, I have a big voice. You need to... Uh, <laughs> oh dear. Uh, the one th as I was listening to you, and the kept thing I, you know was going through my mind is you're, you know I mean, think you're talking about children learning content, but then as I was going along, I realized you were talking about children learning how to think, and that is what I think is so crucial. You can learn content, but if you don't know how to think, all the content in the world is for nothing. And I think that's what I was getting from this. Absolutely. Um, you know, and, and we, we really scaffold it and mesh it together. And, and you know, knowing that um, deep thinking, children have to have something to think about, right? So um, we, we try to make sure that for every, every lesson is rich in both. Yeah. And that the arts allow for that kind of deeper thinking. Anybody else? Come on. I 
If you don't, if you don't ask questions, I will. Oh, can you come up here and, and ask the question? You're, you're very brave. Thank you. Yes, right. Um, one of my my question is: I am an art teacher, and I have been in um, some of those restrictive environments that you have talked about in the past. How do you advocate? Um, using, I would say, your thinking strategies or methods of arts integration into an environment that has had a revolving door of the arts being in some time, being out some time, and then having possibly uh, supervisors who have no clue. It's like speaking Chinese to them as far as what your curriculum is and what you're trying to um, convey to your students and how it's beneficial to the overall culture of the school. Yeah. That's a great question. I, I like to think that um, it's got to come from both ends. It's got to come from the policy level above, and then it's got to come from the grassroots below, where principals aren't deciding that they're going to get rid of the arts or school districts. You know, they're, they're seeing the value. But that's why I'm doing the research I am, because I, I really think that whether it's policymakers or that individual principal decision, um, if the arts are considered fluff, and dispensable, then we're never going to change anything. So if we can show through our study that children retain information better and are better engaged, I didn't talk about student engagement, but we're measuring that too, their attention and their, their joy in learning. If we can show that through empirical research, then we think that we're going to push the envelope that much more. And you know, anybody who's gone into a school where there's art, you can just see the difference. You know, you just see instead of pieces of paper on the wall that are eight and a half by 11, you see beautiful children's work all the time. Um, so it, you know, for me as a principal, when I started to really embrace and, and promote arts integration, the whole school changed. It just didn't look like the same place anymore. Um, and you know, I never did a top-down thing either. I didn't tell everybody, okay, now you all have to integrate the arts and you all have to do the brain-targeted teaching model. But as some started to do it and try it, it just started to bloom because other teachers who were not doing it, the kids would be bored in their class, didn't want to be in their class, so they started to see the value of it. Parents would come in and say, well, in this class, they're doing that. Mm -hmm. So um, it, it can, yeah, it can blossom. But it has to start somewhere, and you're really right to say that it's got to start with those supervisors who get it and understand it. Yeah. Yes. There's an organization I'm sure you're familiar with called Maddie. Yes. And Maddie is the Maryland Artists and Teachers Institute, and they're all about teaching teachers how to utilize arts integration. And uh, you know what's so great about it is you don't have to be an art teacher, although that's a plus, but it's really any teacher that wants to learn how to do so can go through this Maddie program. And the really exciting part of Maddie is it is um, basically free in the sense that the state feels so strongly about it that they are sponsoring teachers by uh, requiring some kind of deposit either for individual or teams coming from a given school, but then that money is returned once you complete the program, which does require that you come up with a lesson plan that is, is incorporating arts integration, and I believe there is some college credit applied as well. So it's really a great program. Thank you for mentioning Maddie. I have to say that um, you know teams of schools go together, um, and when I was principal, my team went, and I had other meetings that day, so I said, well, I'm just here to observe, and I was in the Black cherry puppet, Michael. So I'm, I'm like, no, no, I'm, I'm not here to do this. <laughs> I can't do this. <laughs> my, my teachers are doing. It. He said, no, 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 you can't be in here and not do it. I'm like, okay. So he makes me sit. You know, he, here's your materials. Now you can do it too. You can do it. So I made a little red fox, and I was so proud of myself. And do you know that is still in my office at Hopkins? <laughs> Anybody can learn to do this. Yes, you don't have to be artistic. Yes. It was interesting what you said about uh, brain activities and learning. I'm a vocalist, and I work almost every day in elder care. Oh. So I go to senior homes and nursing homes, 
And I can see similar things happening right there in the room when we play jazz or I sing standards and people recognize some of the tunes, can sing along or we have certain numbers that they can get engaged. Just yesterday we had basically a spring fever program which emotionally really brought a lot of release and joy and other emotions too. And one lady spoke to me a lot and the caregiver came later and said, this woman has not been verbal for months. Oh my goodness. It was so powerful. That is a great story. Oh my goodness, thank you for sharing that. The power of the arts. Yep, yeah, very much, I see it every day. Oh. Well, let us once more thank Marielle Hardiman for coming.